Sunday morning exhaustion for the wish for a few more drowsy minutes in bed. Let us wake up to this world we live in, to its beauty and its wonder, also to its tragedy and its pain. We must wake up to this reality that not all in our world have what we do, however much or however little that may be. We must wake up to the idea that our wholeness, our lives are only as complete as the lives of those around us, of those we are inextricably tied to in this great web of mutuality. We must not only wake up but stay woke. In the words of our friends and colleagues involved in Black Lives Matter, working every day for racial justice in our country. Let us wake up, let us stay awake, and let us stay woke. And in this time, in this place, whether this place be here in our sanctuary or joining us online, let us worship. that social anxiety has on my life because I've been a member of this church for more than 14 years. And people here ex accept me as I am. It helps me tremendously, so thank you all. And if you're new to this church or if today is the first time you visited, I want you to know that you are welcome here. Welcome in the fullness of who you are for you to do as you wish in that regard.
And as we begin, I also want to acknowledge that this church occupies land of the Huchin. It's the unceded territory of the Chochenyo speaking Ohlone folks. And we understand that we continue to benefit from the seizure and the occupation of this land, and we acknowledge and we embrace our responsibility, our responsibility to take restorative action. We affirm this is a deeply felt and we commit our congregation to be in right relationship with indigenous communities, aligning in solidarity, supporting the indigenous projects and caring properly for the land. Let us kindle our chalice flame with these words. As we light our chalice, may we, may we remember the life and work of Martin Luther King Jr. and all of the freedom fighters he inspired whose lives had also been beacons of hope and equality and justice that continues to spill light on our path. We want to light the four candles of resilience now. And we, want, we also pause to remind ourselves of some of the foundations of resilience. With Reverend Michelle, we light a candle of courage, a candle of acts of service, a candle of fellowship, and a candle of hope. May we find and cultivate these foundations of resilience in ourselves and in one another. And now please rise in body or spirit and join in singing our opening song, Building a New Way, and the words will be on the screen. saying our covenant. Love guides this church. The quest for truth and justice is its common purpose. To give thanks, listen deeply, speak with care, honor our differences, and seek and grant forgiveness. These things we covenant with one another. Please have a seat.
I invite you to rise and join me if you are young of spirit or young of body. In honor of Martin Luther King's birthday, um, I am going to read a time for all ages about honoring our ancestors. Can you hear me? You can definitely hear me now. Yay. <laughs> hello, hello. <laughs> all right. Let's try this too. <laughs> so in honor of Martin Luther King's birthday, uh, we're going to read a story that honors our ancestors because he is definitely a very wonderful ancestor that has taught us so much. So this is called um, We Are One, and it is the story version of a song by Sweet Honey in the Rock that maybe some of you have heard. So, For each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. We are our grandmother's prayers. We are our grandfather's dreamings. We are the breath of our ancestors. We are the spirit of God. We are mothers of courage. And fathers of time. Can I give you a job? Yeah? Okay. Can you turn the pages for me? We can all see. I love it. Best helper in the world. Daughters of dust and sons of great vision. We are sisters of mercy, brothers of love, Lovers of life and the builders of nations. We are seekers of truth, keepers of faith, makers of peace and the wisdom of ages. We are our grandmother's prayers. We are our grandfather's dreamings. We are the breath of our ancestors, and we are one. Good job. Blessings. So we have Celebration Chapel now. We're going to do some meditation, some mindfulness, some yoga. And just a reminder, Time for All Ages truly is, I'm um, sorry, Celebration Chapel is Time for All Ages extended so you don't have to be a child to come to celebration chapel if you should so choose we'll be meeting in the fireside now are you ready
What a wonderful world. Thank you, Kathleen. What a wonderful world that we share with one another. And in this world, there are joys and celebrations that we may be holding. And in this wonderful world, we hold the balance of human experience and may also be holding heavinesses, sorrows, things that weigh on our souls. So we open our space and our heart to all of these things in our world the joys, the happinesses, the celebrations, as well as the challenges that we may each be facing. I invite us into a time of silence this morning as we honor and hold these things in ourselves and remember those and those around us. Please join me now in a moment of silence. I invite you now to join me in the spirit of prayer. When we pause to remember who we are, companions on this grand experiment called life, when we take a moment to shed the ways we've been carefully taught, to lead from fear, to punish the poor, to prosecute those who do not look like we do, to deny rights to those who love, to believe we are separate, that some people are superior to others, these things we have been taught by our society. 
when we take a moment to shed all of that and instead hear our stories, hear and see each other into existence, into community, when we take a moment to embrace and practice a different way of being, then we answer the call of love. Then we are living into the promise of building the world we dream about. It is beautiful to dream, to cast a vision, to stretch our minds into the future and imagine what may be if we were to build a new way of being. Not someday, but beginning today. Beginning again every day that we have breath, taking courage with the hands and hearts to make real a dream of a more equitable world. To journey together, seeking to be transformed even as we transform. Being explorers and learners in this world around us, humbled by what we do not yet know, fulfilling a promise of healing this fragmented world we live in, laboring not just in hope, but also in love. In this spirit, we commit. In this spirit, we gather. In this spirit, we pray. Amen. Please, please remain seated to join in our meditative song, there is a balm in Gilead. The words will be on screen. I soulfully love Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. because of the man he was and because how he has helped a gigantic proportion of the world's population to learn about 
anxiety and learn about racism. And I'm going to talk today, and I'm going to use the phrase, that's MLK working. And I don't mean specifically Martin Luther King Jr. I mean everyone in this world who has helped the cause of fighting racial injustice. Some of you are in this room now, maybe all of you. So that phrase, that's MLK working, is for everyone who has helped the cause. And the picture on the screen you see is from the 2015 2015 commemoration of the Selma to Montgomery March. And that march included Bloody Sunday, one of the most horrible events this country's ever been through. On the left, you see the Republican governor at the time, Robert Bentley. And in the middle is Dr. Bernice King, Martin Luther King Jr.'s daughter. And the woman on the right is Peggy Wallace, Kennedy. She is Governor George Wallace's daughter. And the governor of Alabama is standing there along with MLK, MLK's daughter and Governor Wallace's daughter. This is one of the most gorgeous events that has ever happened in the history of our earth. That's MLK working. When Peggy Wallace Kennedy's son, eight-year-old son, asked her, Mom, why did Granddaddy do such horrible things to other people? He was eight years old. And she said to him, I don't know why Papa did those horrible things to other people, but I know he was wrong. So maybe it will have to be up to you and me to help make things right. That's MLK working. And I've learned about white, my white privileges and my advantages at an NVC retreat that my wife Julie and I go to every year. A friend of mine at the retreat asked me if I would sit with her and our friend Jose and these two people of color. They wanted to ask me questions about why do white people do what white people do. I'm emphasizing that too much. That's not how they presented it. So we met at lunch, and the two of us, or the three of us, my two people of color friends and myself, we sat, held hands, and cried for over an hour as they told me what it's like for them to be a person of color and walk out of their house every day. I had no idea what people of color go through. That happened about seven years ago. And I recently asked Jose if he would give me some information perhaps that he could share with you about that retreat we were at and about that lunch that Jose, Boothy, and I had, where again we sobbed as they told me what it was like for a person of color to be in this society every day as they leave their house. Jose said, absolutely yes. And these are his words. He wants you to he wants me to tell them to you. I quote, Amigo, so glad to know that you will be sharing your experience. That day was meaningful for me. And at the time, I didn't realize how much of an impact it would have. If time permits and you find purpose, I would be okay with you sharing that years later, I have faith and I feel a sense of comfort knowing that you and others like you acknowledge and recognize the experience of people of color. And more importantly, you're out there doing work that I cannot do. I feel slightly safer walking outside and being myself because of that. It really does make a difference, Jose said.
I'd like to make a request of the white people who are hearing me speak today. If you wish, please sit with a friend of color and have them tell you what it's like to be a person of color and walk outside of their house every day and what it's like inside as they see our culture on and hear it on TV, on, hear, see it on TV or hear it on the radio. And just listen. Just listen. That's MLK working. Thank you, Reverend Dr. King, for making this, per this place a much beautiful place, much more beautiful place to be in. Mask. Get your mask on. Electric, please. Thank you. So, do y'all know the image of the Earth known as the blue marble? Of course. It was taken by the crew of Apollo 17 in 1972 and is one of the most reproduced images in all of human history. It is one of the few photos showing the entirety of the planet, well, half of the planet because it is a ball after all, since the sun was behind the astronauts and its name came from thinking it looked like a marble. While it is often reproduced with Antarctica at the bottom, the cloudiest part, or to the side like it is on our flag, the astronauts saw it with Antarctica up at the top because of course there is no up or down in the weightlessness of space. This image did a lot of things for us and really represented a shift in the overall thinking of humanity. Instead of just seeing ourselves as participants on this vast, seemingly unending Earth, it showed the, fin the finiteness and commonality of our celestial home. A while back, these are now notes from um, Dr. Martin Luther King's essay, The World, Our World House, hence the title today. A while back, after a famous novelist had died, his family was going through his papers and notes about ideas for future stories he had written down. Amongst these, one was heavily, heavily underlined. A widely separated family inherits a house in which they have to live together. Now, aside from being both a great idea for, for a story as well as a brilliant way to bequest property, well, either brilliant or sadistic or both at the same time, it also speaks well to these times in which we live. Whether we like it or not, whether we choose to or not, we, as all of humanity, are living in one house, are in this one house, this one earth, in which we have to live together. And this one big world house of ours isn't going anywhere. If anything, its needs and our needs within it are growing and becoming more and more urgent. Now, before we go on, a word of explanation for how I approach our annual remembrance of Dr. King. Many folks at this time of the year and this particular Sunday talk about Dr. King's ideas and share things that Dr. King said during his time and about his accomplishments. Now, I don't do exactly that. Instead, I look to Dr. King as a prophetic voice to inspire us and I ask, what would he say about the challenges and issues that we face today? So today we'll be taking a look at some of Dr. King's writings, but directly asking what they mean for us. And it is unnerving how relevant so many of his thoughts are, as if he had written them just this past week. Today, our inspiration comes primarily from a piece by Dr. King titled The World House, which he wrote not just last week, of course, but in 1967. From before Dr. King's time to today, we live on this increasingly interconnected planet. While geographic distance once separated us and we faced the limits of human-level power and human-based computations and communications, 
Those times are long beyond us now. Scientific and technological advances shrink the world more and more every single day. But as they do, they also make us ever more dependent and interdependent upon one another. This brings us to the one blue marble on which we all reside. One finite planet where we may hold in our hand, anyone want to hold up a sm their smartphone? I know somebody's got it right in their head, there we go. Where we might hold in our hand a tiny computer with more computational power than what once filled an entire factory and can make a call to someone literally on the other side of the planet in real time. I mean, that's amazing, isn't it? These tiny computers would have seemed to be nearly indistinguishable from magic, even in the time of Dr. King. But as Dr. King reminds us, our tech, as he says, our, tech, our scientific and technological advancement has outpaced our moral and spiritual development. I'll say that again, our scientific and technological advancement has outpaced our moral and spiritual development. As he says, our moral and spiritual lag must be redeemed. When our scientific power outruns our moral power, we end up with guided missiles and misguided men. When we foolishly minimize the internal of our lives and maximize the external, we signed the warrant for our own day of doom. Like I said, relevant. Taking his point, our grand scientific and technological achievements have created our connected world, our world house. But we haven't yet figured out how to live in a civil and responsible manner together in that world house. We've moved into this grand house together, yet we still haven't figured out how to properly share it. We're still living, well, not quite in a neighborhood, because that implies some sort of overall cohesion, but rather we are living in this unincorporated territory together. And we must move towards a compassionate and connected neighborhood, recognizing the metaphorical roof under which we all reside. So, okay, taking these, I got to thinking about what sorts of things we would need to have as agreements or at least aspirations to move towards this kind of community. In the spirit of Unitarian minister Robert Fulgham, do you know he was a Unitarian minister? Yes. In the spirit of Robert Fulgham's All I Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten, inspired by Dr. King's World House, here are my house rules for how we can live together. So there's seven of them. I'll run through them, and then we'll sit with each one for a minute. Number one, clean up after yourself. Number two, share. Three, be considerate. Number four, everyone has chores. Number five, find ways to get along. Number six is a corollary to number five, no door slamming. And number seven, be kind to others in the house. So there's my take on the house rules to make this global thing that we have work. All right, number one, clean up after yourself. We live in a world that's gotten pretty trashed, have we not? I'm talking literal trash, nuclear trash, litter, plastic floating around in our oceans, if, and if you want to go there, some pretty trashy language and trashy communication. And what happens with waste ends up adversely affecting poor communities and marginalized communities and endangering this entire space that we share. Some have even claimed that garbage will be one of the major issues of the 21st century, even as our landfills fill up and new ones are virtually impossible to start as our nuclear waste depositing sites because of the NIMBY, not in my backyard, sentiment. How much would this change if we simply took responsibility for cleaning up after ourselves in all of the forms that that might take? All right, number two, you ready for it? Share. You're not the only one here. Simple, yes, but the gulf between the wealthiest in our country and the world 
and the poorest in our country and our world continues to grow. Dr. King named poverty as one of the most important issues facing our planet. And Gandhi claimed that poverty is the worst form of violence. A functional house and responsible community doesn't let that kind of disparity continue because frankly, it never will be any sort of a connected house while the poverty and gulf are there. Just as in a house where common space and common property are shared and taken care of, we must do so in our world. All right, house rule number three, be considerate. When you use the last of the toilet paper, put a fresh roll on, right? Don't eat the last cookies just because they're there. Who grew up in a house where the toilet paper thing was a rule? Yes. Or taking out the trash when you filled up the bag, not just putting the lid back on it, let me push it down a little bit more so it doesn't look like it's too full. Who's done that lately? Okay, I have two. It's a tiny example of humility and awareness that there are, in fact, others around you sharing the same space that you do. And when you grow up with the cookie plate dilemma of this great big plate of cookies, so of course I can eat as many as I want. When you grow up with the cookie, when you, the cookie plate dilemma on a larger scale, you end up with what's called the tragedy of the commons, where resources seem so plentiful that there isn't awareness about their innate finiteness. And there are so many exa other examples of how being considerate would help our world community. All right, number four, everyone has chores. Everyone must contribute to the functioning of a house to the degree that they each reasonably can. Now the two-year-old in the house won't be asked to go fix the roof, but they can pick up their toys. Everyone contributes and those who are capable of contributing more do. This is part of taking responsibility for the house, for its present and for its future. It is not like the Australian president once said, not our responsibility to reduce emissions just because we produce less than others. There are no free rides. We all need to show up and do our part. Number five, find ways to get along and not fight. Although reality shows the fights are really, you know, they, they amp those up because the reality shows of living in the one house, we, they like the fights, but no, that's not reality. Find ways to get along and not fight. We are all stuck in this house together and that's not gonna change. Along with racism and poverty, peace was the other most important issue to Dr. King and its importance has not changed one bit. With the current capabilities around the world, we could truly end up with what Dr. King has warned us against. When he said, when our scientific power outruns our moral power, we end up with guided missiles and misguided men. Now we can joke about ways to solve world peace, whether overnight or not, but joking aside, this is something critical that we have to find our way through and urgently. Number six, no door slamming or taking your marbles and going home or bullying or gaslighting or any of the other ever more advanced ways that we have created to put walls and inequities between us. Growing up with four siblings, I had multiple opportunities to experience firsthand the dangers of slamming doors, especially when the person slamming wasn't being mindful of the hand in the door jam, multiple broken fingers. Conflict and disagreement are totally normal. They're not inherently good or bad. Conflict and disagreement happen in this world house. Tension and differences will happen on all scales, but let's try to find healthy adult ways of dealing with it. And last, number seven, be kind to others in the house. According to Dr. King, quote, the stability of the large world house, which is ours, will involve a revolution of values to accompany the scientific and freedom revolutions engulfing the earth. 
We must rapidly begin the shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. Like I said, could have written that yesterday. We need a revolution of values. We need a revolution of the moral and spiritual values that can bridge the gulf that has grown between so many of us today. A gulf in the way we talk to one another across distances, a gulf in the way we relate to one another and in the way that decisions or policies are made with respect to one another. Finding ways, whatever they might be, to bridge the gulf between the political differences that are carving our country into pieces. We need a revolution of values nationwide and worldwide, a moral and spiritual revolution nationwide and worldwide. There are many values that we may look to for renewal and revival, justice, equity, dignity, freedom, honesty, respect, fairness, commitment, courage, peace, the courage can be hard some days. Did you see how hard it was for me to light the courage candle today? It had an itty bitty flame. I went ahead and switched it to a candle where we could all see the light because we need that courage. Many have speculated about what the mother value might be of these, the value from which all others come. You probably have ideas on that. I've got my opinion about that, that mother value. And that's what I think our world house and our revolution of values need. They need all of them, embracing, accepting, hoping, challenging, inspiring. And what I think the mother value is, compassion. Because if we have compassion for others, if we see in our common humanity and their lives and their needs can begin to matter as much as our own, if we have compassion for others, we can be in relationship with them and then the distances can be bridged. Compassion, true embracing compassion. Loving kindness that reaches out beyond the boundaries of ourselves and the folks that we can immediately see around us. Our world house will never be a related and independent, interdependent house until there is compassion flowing all the way through. Dr. King notes that a great nation is a compassionate one. I couldn't agree more. A great home, a great neighborhood, a great community, and a great nation are all compassionate ones. And, if I may, if we truly want to make America great again, we need to make America compassionate again. And this isn't all talk. It can't be, and it's not all jokes, it can't be. It, is something, it isn't something we can take to at our, at our leisure. These are just too urgent. It is time for action, and this is what Dr. King's words call us to. In his words, we are faced now with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with a fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. Procrastination is the thief of time. We may cry out desperately for time to pause in her passage on, but time is deaf to every plea, and time rushes on. He keeps going, this is fabulous imagery. Over the bleached bones and jumbled residues of numerous civilizations are written the pathetic words, too late. We still have a choice today, nonviolent coexistence or violent co-annihilation. This may well be humanity's last chance to choose between chaos and community. Our world house is already around us, replicated in different sizes and scales all everywhere. It is our neighborhoods. It is our communities, our states, our nations. It is our world. We live in it and are utterly dependent on it, whether we want to be or not, whether we look and see it or not. But it doesn't work like it must, but it must. It is our choice, our choice between the chaos that may be down the road 
or the interdependent, compassionate community that we desperately need. I hope that you will join me and all of us in making the choice for community. Blessed be. One of the main jobs of a worship associate is to gather the folks together and bring them to bring this presentation to us. And that's always a pleasure because people are so willing to give. But we all outdid ourselves this morning. One of us took sick at the last minute and couldn't make it today. However, the call went out to the barking chain and within 20 minutes, everything was shifted Someone moved over here, someone moved over there, a new person came in and was all ready to go. I love the people at this church. In fact, if I must confess, one of the reasons I don't mind giving our money, Julia's and my money, to UUCB is because of the gorgeous people that belong to and are associated with our church. And I have a thought. As you're contemplating what to donate today, or uh, you may sit down and think, sit down as you are now, and think, maybe I want to pledge this amount. So if you're thinking about what to donate today or what to pledge today, maybe it would be helpful to think of someone at this church who has been gloriously kind to you. Or maybe there was a time when you were able to give of your soul and your heart in such a manner that you felt as comfortable as you can. And consider that with your donation or with your pledge next week. And we are continuing. Oh, did I mention this is the part of the sermon where we ask you service, where we ask you for money? Okay. We're continuing to conduct the offering without passing the plate. Instead, you can either give electronically by scanning the code on the back of your badge. I just found that out recently. <clears throat> or you can put cash or check donation into the donation envelope that you'll find in the back of the pew in front of you. Please write your name on the envelope. That's how we know to track it for deduction purposes. And our offering plate or the pledge amount today or pledge, and then put it into, oh, you offer, let me straighten that out. So you mark offering plate or pledge to clearly identify it, and then put it into the don donation box beside the fountain in the atrium when you leave the service. And each week, half of the offering plate is shared with a nonprofit good neighbor organization recommended by our Social Justice Council. And we're grateful that you've continued to practice generosity with UUCB and our good neighbors through the difficult years we've been having. And your offering of any value is always received with gratitude. And this month, our good neighbor is the Richmond High School Marching Band. They're raising money to march at Disneyland this year to give Richmond High students a chance to travel outside their community and provide the background for many learning opportunities. Andrew Wilkie is the director of the band, and he says thank you.
Please join me um, please join me in dedicating our offering. We dedicate our offering and ourselves to the mission of this congregation to create loving community, inspire spiritual growth, and encourage lives of integrity, joy, and service. Wasn't that music gorgeous? Oh my goodness. It has been so good being. Amplified. There we go, okay. It has been so good being with you today. I have a few things to note, the ever important announcements before we sing our last song and go on with our day. First of all, we're running a flash drive drive right now collecting used flash drives and SD cards and micro SD cards for Flash Drives for Freedom, which works with defectors from North Korea and activists in South Korea to fill these with information and smuggle them into North Korea. So if you have old, old media like that that you aren't using anymore, bring it onto the church. We'll have the basket out in the atrium all month. If you are new to UU and UUCB, we would invite you to come to our a lunch today. Does UCB like, feel like it might be able to be your spiritual home? We can come and talk more. Or just Do you want to get to know some people here and their values more? After the service in the fireside room, our welcoming and membership team invite you to come to lunch. Yes, there's food involved too. Come and find out what this community can offer to you and your family and hear others who are new here also. If you have any questions, Lonnie and Victoria will be around in the atrium and then, of course, in the fireside room. And then many, it's not everybody yet, but if you look at many of the name tags, I think it's certainly the first half of the alphabet, there's a barcode on there now. So if you take a look at your name tag, there are barcodes that have appeared on many of them. And instead of typing things in on the iPad or tablet or whatever it is, as you're coming in, we are very soon going to have a scanner that you can just pop that barcode under just to make things easier for everyone when they're getting to church. So look to see that rolled out in the coming Sundays. And last, tomorrow, Martin Luther King Day, there will be a motorcade parade in El Cerrito. If you are curious about it, and I think there might be a graphic up on the board, maybe? No? Okay, well, there's an awesome flyer. And there's more information. Talk to Natalie at the Social Justice Council table in the atrium after the service. Oh, there it is. Isn't it pretty? I hope that you can make it. And now, let's, ha let's sing. We'll be singing Answering the Call of Love, which may be called the UU Anthem. Please rise in body or in spirit. The words will be on screen. Promise of the Spirit, faith, hope, and love abide. And so every soul is blessed may know the truth in our heart is our God. We are answering the call of love. Hands joined together, our hearts beat as one. Emboldened by faith, we dare to proclaim. Yeah. 
join together as hearts beat as one and moving by faith we dare to proclaim we are answering the call of love we are answering the call compassion that we can overcome the challenges facing humanity. When we can truly celebrate the diversity of contributions and talents offered by all people, we shall overcome hatred and prejudice and oppression. When we can truly extend our hands to one another in loving acceptance, we shall overcome the past that haunts us. Living in peace and freedom, we shall overcome the wrongs that have happened and the debts left unpaid. Come join together in that commitment to overcome, and let us say together, Amen. Amen. Blessed be. Please be seated for the postlude. <laughs> 